Hello, hello y YouTube viewers, this is Blake Fannin. Please pay very close attention, like, share, and sub subscribe. Thank you. Chapter 3 after dark one evening, a Jewish religious leader named Nicodemus, a Pharisee, came to speak with Jesus. Teacher, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are proof enough that God is with you. Jesus replied, I assure you, unless you are born again, you can never see the kingdom of God. What do you mean? exclaimed Nicodemus. How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, The truth is, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives new life from heaven. So don't be surprised at my statement that you must be born again. Just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. What do you mean? Nicodemus asked. Jesus replied, You are a respected Jewish teacher, and yet you don't understand these things. I assure you, I am telling you what we know and have seen, and yet you won't believe us. But if you don't even believe me when I tell you about things that happen here on earth, how can you possibly believe if I tell you what is going on in heaven? For only I, the Son of Man, have come to earth and will return to heaven again. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so I, the Son of Man, must be lifted up on a pole, so that everyone who believes in me will have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn it, but to save it. There is no judgment awaiting those who trust him, but those who do not trust him have already been judged for not believing in the only Son of God. Their judgment. First John, chapter 1. The one who existed from the beginning is the one we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is Jesus Christ, the word of life. This one who is life from God was shown to us and we have seen him. And now we testify and announce to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father and then he was shown to us. First John, chapter 1. The one who existed from the beginning is the one we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is Jesus Christ, the word of life. This one who is life from God was shown to us and we have seen him. And now we testify and announce to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father and then he was shown to us. We are telling you about what we ourselves have actually seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy will be complete. This is the message He has given us to announce to you. God is light and there is no darkness in Him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not living in the truth. But if we are living in the light of God's presence just as Christ is, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from every sin. If we say we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and refusing to accept the truth. But if we confess our sins to Him, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from every wrong. If 4. 
Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the Spirit they have comes from God. For there are many false prophets in the world. This is the way to find out if they have the Spirit of God. If a prophet acknowledges that Jesus Christ became a human being, that person has the Spirit of God. If a prophet does not acknowledge Jesus, that person is not from God. Such a person has the spirit of the Antichrist. You have heard that he is going to come into the world, and he is already here. But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won your fight with these false prophets, because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. These people belong to this world, so they speak from the world's viewpoint, and the world listens to them. But we belong to God. That is why those who know God listen to us. If they do not belong to God, they do not listen to us. That is how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is born of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much He loved us by sending His only Son into the world so that we might have eternal life through Him. This is real love. It is not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us. His love has been brought to full expression through us. And God has given us His Spirit as proof that we live in Him and He in us. Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. All who proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, and they live in God. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in Him. God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face Him with confidence, because we are like Christ here in this world. Such love has no fear, because perfect love expels all fear. If Did you hear that? Perfect love expels all fear. I repeat, did you hear that? Perfect love expels all fear. N now, let's go back to, well, I mean, let's go to the, the book of John, and I'm going to let you hear, hear the rest of it from John 14 on. So listen very, very closely to this part. Thank you, because this is the most important part. Chapter 14. Don't be troubled. You trust God, now trust in me. There are many rooms in my father's home, and I am going to prepare a place for you. If this were not so, I would tell you plainly. When everything is ready, I will come and get you, so that you will always be with me where I am and you know where I am going and how to get there. No, we don't know, Lord, Thomas said. We haven't any idea where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus told them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had known who I am, then you would have known who my Father is. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus replied, Philip, don't you even yet know who I am, even after all the time I have been with you? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father, so why are you asking to see him? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me or at least believe because of what you have seen me do. The truth is, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done, and even greater works, because I am going to be with the Father. 
You can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it, because the work of the Son brings glory to the Father. Yes, ask anything in my name, and I will do it. If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world at large cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him, but you do because he lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. In just a little while, the world will not see me again, but you will, for I will live again and you will too. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Those who obey my commandments are the ones who love me, and because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them, and I will reveal myself to each one of them. Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but the other disciple with that name, said to him, Lord, why are you going to reveal yourself only to us? and not to the world at large. Jesus replied, All those who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and live with them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not do what I say. And remember, my words are not my own. This message is from the Father who sent me. I am telling you these things now, while I am still with you. But when the Father sends the Counselor as my representative, by the Counselor, I mean the Holy Spirit. He will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I myself have told you. I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give isn't like the peace the world gives. So don't be troubled or afraid. Remember what I told you. I am going away, but I will come back to you again. If you really love me, you will be very happy for me because now I can go to the Father who is greater than I am. I have told you these things before they happen so that you will believe when they do happen. I don't have much more time to talk to you because the prince of this world approaches. He has no power over me, but I will do what the Father requires of me so that the world will know that I love the Father. Come, let's be going. Chapter 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned for greater fruitfulness by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful apart from me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Anyone who parts from me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you stay joined to me and my words remain in you, you may ask any request you like and it will be granted. My true disciples produce much fruit this brings great glory to my Father. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey me, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father and remain in his love. I have told you this so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. I command you to love each other in the same way that I love you. And here is how to measure it. The greatest love is shown when people lay down their lives for their friends. You are my friends if you obey me. I no longer call you servants because a master doesn't confide in his servants. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce fruit that will last so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. I command you to love each other. When the world hates you, remember it hated me before it hated you. The world would love you if you belong to it, but you don't. I chose you to come out of the world, and so it hates you. Do you remember what I told you? A servant is not greater than the master. 
Since they persecuted me, naturally they will persecute you. And if they had listened to me, they would listen to you. The people of the world will hate you because you belong to me, for they don't know God who sent me. They would not be guilty if I had not come and spoken to them. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Anyone who hates me hates my father too. If I hadn't done such miraculous signs among them that no one else could do, they would not be counted guilty. But as it is, they saw all that I did and yet hated both of us, me and my father. This has fulfilled what the scripture said. They hated me without cause. But I will send you the counselor, the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the father and will tell you all about me. And you must also tell others about me because you have been with me from the beginning. Chapter 16. I have told you these things so that you won't fall away. For you will be expelled from the synagogues and the time is coming when those who kill you will think they are doing God a service. This is because they have never known the Father or me. Yes, I'm telling you these things now so that when they happen you will remember I warned you. I didn't tell you earlier because I was going to be with you for a while longer. But now I am going away to the one who sent me, and none of you has asked me where I am going. Instead, you are very sad. But it is actually best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the counselor won't come. If I do go away, he will come because I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convince the world of its sin and of God's righteousness, and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is unbelief in me. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. Judgment will come because the prince of this world has already been judged. Oh, there is so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not be presenting his own ideas. He will be telling you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by revealing to you whatever he receives from me. All that the Father has is mine. This is what I mean when I say that the Spirit will reveal to you whatever he receives from me. In just a little while, I will be gone, and you won't see me anymore. Then, just a little while after that, you will see me again. The disciples asked each other, What does he mean when he says, You won't see me, and then you will see me? And what does he mean when he says, I am going to the Father? And what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand. Jesus realized they wanted to ask him, so he said, Are you asking yourselves what I meant? I said, In just a little while, I will be gone and you won't see me anymore. Then, just a little while after that, you will see me again. Truly, you will weep and mourn over what is going to happen to me, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will suddenly turn to wonderful joy when you see me again. It will be like a woman experiencing the pains of labor. When a child is born, her anguish gives place to joy because she has brought a new person into the world. You have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Then you will rejoice and no one can rob you of that joy. At that time, you won't need to ask me for anything. The truth is, you can go directly to the Father and ask Him, and He will grant your request because you use my name. You haven't done this before. Ask using my name, and you will receive, and you will have abundant joy. I have spoken of these matters in parables, but the time will come when this will not be necessary, and I will tell you plainly all about the Father. Then you will ask in my name. I'm not saying I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you dearly because you love me and believe that I came from God. Yes, I came from the Father into the world, and I will leave the world and return to the Father. Then his disciples said, at last you are speaking plainly and not in parables. Now we understand that you know everything and don't need anyone to tell you anything. From this we believe that you came from God. Jesus asked, do you finally believe? But the time is coming, in fact it is already here, when you will be scattered, 
each one going his own way, leaving me alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Chapter 17. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the time has come. Glorify your son so he can give glory back to you. For you have given him authority over everyone in all the earth. He gives eternal life to each one you have given him. And this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. I brought glory to you here on earth by doing everything you told me to do. And now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. I have told these men about you. They were in the world, but then you gave them to me. Actually, they were always yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you, for I have passed on to them the words you gave me, and they accepted them, and know that I came from you, and they believe you sent me. My prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me, because they belong to you. And all of them, since they are mine, belong to you. And you have given them back to me, so they are my glory. Now I am departing the world. I am leaving them behind and coming to you. Holy Father, keep them and care for them, all those you have given me, so that they will be united just as we are. During my time here, I have kept them safe. I guarded them so that not one was lost, except the one headed for destruction as the scriptures foretold. And now I am coming to you. I have told them many things while I was with them, so they would be filled with my joy. I have given them your word, and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They are not part of this world any more than I am. Make them pure and holy by teaching them your words of truth. As you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world, and I give myself entirely to you, so they also might be entirely yours. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me because of their testimony. My prayer for all of them is that they will be one, just as you and I are one, Father. That just as you are in me and I am in you, so they will be in us, and the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are, I in them and you in me all being perfected into one. Then the world will know that you sent me and will understand that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want these whom you've given me to be with me so they can see my glory. You gave me the glory because you loved me even before the world began. O oh, righteous Father, the world doesn't know you, but I do. And these disciples know you sent me. And I have revealed you to them and will keep on revealing you. I will do this so that your love for me may be in them and I in them. Chapter 18. After saying these things, Jesus crossed the Kidron Valley with his disciples and entered a grove of olive trees. Judas, the betrayer, knew this place because Jesus had gone there many times with his disciples. The leading priests and Pharisees had given Judas a battalion of Roman soldiers and temple guards to accompany him. Now with blazing torches, lanterns, and weapons, they arrived at the olive grove. Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him. Stepping forward to meet them, he asked, Whom are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth! They replied, I am he, Jesus said. Judas was standing there with them when Jesus identified himself, and as he said, I am he, they all fell backward to the ground. Once more he asked them, Whom are you searching for? And again they replied, Jesus of Nazareth! I told you that I am he, Jesus said. And since I am the one you want, let these others go. 
He did this to fulfill his own statement, I have not lost a single one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter drew a sword and slashed off the right ear of Malchus, the high priest's servant. But Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Shall I not drink from the cup the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their commanding officer, and the temple guards arrested Jesus and tied him up. First they took him to Annas, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had told the other Jewish leaders, better that one should die for all. Simon Peter followed along behind, as did another of the disciples. That other disciple was acquainted with the high priest, so he was allowed to enter the courtyard with Jesus. Peter stood outside the gate. Then the other disciple spoke to the woman watching at the gate, and she let Peter in. The woman asked Peter, Aren't you one of Jesus' disciples? No, he said, I am not. The guards and the household servants were standing around a charcoal fire they had made because it was cold. And Peter stood there with them warming himself. Inside, the high priest began asking Jesus about his followers and what he had been teaching them. Jesus replied, What I teach is widely known because I have preached regularly in the synagogues and the temple. I have been heard by people everywhere and I teach nothing in private that I have not said in public. Why are you asking me this question? Ask those who heard me. They know what I said. One of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus on the face. Is that the way to answer the high priest? He demanded. Jesus replied, If I said anything wrong, you must give evidence for it. Should you hit a man for telling the truth? Then Annas bound Jesus and sent him to Caiaphas, the high priest. Meanwhile, as Simon Peter was standing by the fire, they asked him again, Aren't you one of his disciples? I am not, he said. But one of the household servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Didn't I see you out there in the olive grove with Jesus? Again, Peter denied it, and immediately a rooster crowed. Jesus' trial before Caiaphas ended in the early hours of the morning. Then he was taken to the headquarters of the Roman governor. His accusers didn't go in themselves because it would defile them, and they wouldn't be allowed to celebrate the Passover feast. So Pilate, the governor, went out to them and asked, What is your charge against this man? We wouldn't have handed him over to you if he weren't a criminal, they retorted. Then take him away and judge him by your own laws, Pilate told them. Only the Romans are permitted to execute someone, the Jewish leaders replied. This fulfilled Jesus' prediction about the way he would die. Then Pilate went back inside and called for Jesus to be brought to him. Are you the king of the Jews, he asked him. Jesus replied, is this your own question or did others tell you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate asked. Your own people and their leading priests brought you here. Why? What have you done? Then Jesus answered, I am not an earthly king. If I were, my followers would have fought when I was arrested by the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate replied, You are a king then? You say that I am a king and you are right, Jesus said. I was born for that purpose and I came to bring truth to the world. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. What is truth? Pilate asked. Then he went out again to the people and told them, He is not guilty of any crime. But you have a custom of asking me to release someone from prison each year at Passover. So, if you want me to, I'll release the king of the Jews. But they shouted back. No! no not this man! But Barabbas! Barabbas was a criminal. Chapter 19. Then Pilate had Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip. The soldiers made a crown of long, sharp thorns and put it on his head, and they put a royal purple robe on him. Hail, King of the Jews! They mocked, and they hit him with their fists. Pilate went outside again and said to the people, I'm going to bring him out to you now, but understand clearly that I find him not guilty. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said, Here is the man. When they saw him, the leading priests and temple guards began shouting, Crucify! Crucify! You crucify him! Pilate said, I find him not guilty. The Jewish leaders replied, 
by our laws he ought to die because he called himself the son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was more frightened than ever. He took Jesus back into the headquarters again and asked him, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. You won't talk to me, Pilate demanded. Don't you realize that I have the power to release you or to crucify you? Then Jesus said, You would have no power over me at all unless it were given to you from above. So the one who brought me to you has the greater sin. Then Pilate tried to release him, but the Jewish leaders told him, If you release this man, you are not a friend of Caesar. Anyone who declares himself a king is a rebel against Caesar. When they said this, Pilate brought Jesus out to them again. Then Pilate sat down on the judgment seat on the platform that is called the stone pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was now about noon of the day of preparation for the Passover, and Pilate said to the people, Here is your king! Away with him! They yelled. Away with him! Crucify, Crucify him. him! What? Crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar! The leading priest shouted back. Then Pilate gave Jesus to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away, carrying the cross by himself. Jesus went to the place called Skull Hill, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him. There were two others crucified with him, one on either side with Jesus between them. And Pilate posted a sign over him that read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek, so that many people could read it. Then the leading priest said to Pilate, Change it from the King of the Jews to, he said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate replied, What I have written, I have written. It stays exactly as it is. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they divided his clothes among the four of them. They also took his robe, but it was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said, Let's not tear it, but throw dice to see who gets it. This fulfilled the scripture that says, They divided my clothes among themselves and threw dice for my robe. So that is what they did. Standing near the cross were Jesus' mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved, he said to her, Woman, he is your son. And he said to this disciple, She is your mother. And from then on, this disciple took her into his home. Jesus knew that everything was now finished, and to fulfill the scriptures, he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put it on a hyssop branch, and held it up to his lips. When Jesus had tasted it, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The Jewish leaders didn't want the victims hanging there the next day, which was the Sabbath, and a very special Sabbath at that because it was the Passover. So they asked Pilate to hasten their deaths by ordering that their legs be broken then their bodies could be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the two men crucified with Jesus, but when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was dead already, so they didn't break his legs. One of the soldiers, however, pierced his side with a spear, and blood and water flowed out. This report is from an eyewitness giving an accurate account. It is presented so that you also can believe. These things happened in fulfillment of the scriptures that say, not one of his bones will be broken, and they will look on him whom they pierced. Afterward, Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus because he feared the Jewish leaders, asked Pilate for permission to take Jesus' body down. When Pilate gave him permission, he came and took the body away. Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night, also came, bringing about 75 pounds of embalming ointment made from myrrh and aloes. Together they wrapped Jesus' body in a long linen cloth with the spices, as is the Jewish custom of burial. The place of crucifixion was near a garden, where there was a new tomb never used before. And so, because it was the day of preparation before the Passover, and since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Chapter 20. 
Early Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, They've taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and I don't know where they've put him. Peter and the other disciple ran to the tomb to see. The other disciple outran Peter and got there first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen cloth lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying to the side. Then the other disciple also went in, and he saw and believed. For until then, they hadn't realized that the scriptures said he would rise from the dead. Then they went home. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels sitting at the head and foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied. And I don't know where they have put him. She glanced over her shoulder and saw someone standing behind her. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go and get him. Mary, Jesus said. She turned toward him and exclaimed, Teacher, don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But go find my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. Then she gave them his message. That evening, on the first day of the week, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he held out his hands for them to see, and he showed them his side. They were filled with joy when they saw their Lord. He spoke to them again and said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Then he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you refuse to forgive them, they are unforgiven. One of the disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, We have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with him. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. He said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, You believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who haven't seen me and believe anyway. Jesus' disciples saw him do many other miraculous signs besides the ones recorded in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life. Chapter 21. Later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there, Simon Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. At dawn, the disciples saw Jesus standing on the beach, but they couldn't see who he was. He called out, Friends, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, Throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you'll get plenty of fish. So they did, and they couldn't draw in the net because there were so many fish in it. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for work, jumped into the water, and swam ashore. 
The others stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to the shore, for they were only out about 300 feet. When they got there, they saw that a charcoal fire was burning and fish were frying over it. And there was bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to the shore. There were 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. And no one dared ask him if he really was the Lord because they were sure of it. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. This was the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. After breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. Once more, he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. The truth is, when you were young, you were able to do as you liked and go wherever you wanted to. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will direct you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to let him know what kind of death he would die to glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow me. Peter turned around and saw the disciple Jesus loved following them, the one who had leaned over to Jesus during supper and asked, Lord, who among us will betray you? Peter asked Jesus, What about him, Lord? Jesus replied, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You follow me. So the rumor spread among the community of believers that that disciple wouldn't die. But that isn't what Jesus said at all. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is that disciple who saw these events and recorded them here. And we all know that his account of these things is accurate. And I suppose that if all the other things Jesus did were written down, the whole world could not contain the books. Acts chapter 1. Dear Theophilus, Okay, um, okay, you, you, whoops, sorry, uh, oh, here we go, okay, okay, you, you, you YouTube viewers, I, I apologize for any and all sound quality problems, but I hope you heard that good but now listen after hearing all of that do you realize that Jesus died for you he died to save you from hell he he loves you and he wants a r r relationship with you. So now, while I'm preparing for the next part of this video, I advise you to do two things. Pause it and if you and if there's any if there's anything that you need to do, do it right now and next go get a friend or loved one and re-watch this video with them and then once it gets once it gets to this part and the last part which is the ne next part listen very closely like you did in the last part thank you
Okay. Now, have you asked, whoops, oh, sorry. Have you asked Jesus into you, your heart? Because if not, you are running out of time to, whoops, sorry, too loud. If you have not asked Jesus into your heart, you are running out of time. But now, before this video continues, by faith I do not stutter, by faith I talk plain, by faith I do not have trouble speaking. I speak that in, in Jesus' name. Now, YouTube, YouTube viewers, if, if you will read Matthew 24, that passage of scripture will tell you what is going to happen before Jesus returns and and some of it if not all of it has already happened but now listen in an, another passage Jesus said he came that that we may have life and have it more abundantly So, so if you have not asked him into your heart, and if you don't know what that means, asking him into your heart also means that when he when when he comes into your heart, you'll have a relationship with him. So, so, so if you'd like a relationship with him, repeat after me, dear most gracious. Jesus and Heavenly Father, I re repent of all my sins and I ask you to forgive me of anything I've done wrong. I confess I've done wrong and said things that I shouldn't have said and done. So I ask you to forgive me of all the bad things and wrong things that I've said and done and I ask you to Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I ask this in Jesus' name. YouTube viewers, when someone says I've sinned and done this, or 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 when someone mentions sin, sin is sin is is the the Bible's term for doing wrong or talking bad and repenting means you say that 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 you're sorry and you shouldn't have you shouldn't have said or done what you did so so if you just asked if you just asked him into your heart if you just asked Jesus into your heart you need to begin reading reading your Bible every day beginning in the book of Matthew and going all throughout the New Testament first and find a good Bible based church I only recommend the New Living and New King James versions of the Bible because those are the only two that are true and, and, and I'd also like you if you just asked him into your heart let me know in in the comments below thank you please like share and subscribe especially share i also ask you to sh share this video with your friends and loved ones so they can hear the truth too thank you